Nice to see you, finally. Nice to see you, man. Great to talk to you. Thanks for having me, man. I'm just chilling on a Sunday here on Easter, watching a little NBA. I got the guitar. Just relaxing. Man, you're very welcome. And I want to say first that you actually can do what is one of my biggest fears. And I'll tell you, in a, in, <laughs> I'll tell you right now. Okay, I go. have this fear that I'm going to be carrying my guitar and going through security at the airport. And the airport says, all right, fella, come over here. Let's see what's in there. And then I, I show them the guitar and they're like, okay, play us a song. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like you, That's hilarious. you mm -hmm. would be just like, okay, everyone gather around. I yeah, right. <laughs> oh, I would have fun with that. Would make the, uh, air, that would make the airport experience a little more pleasant for me. Trust me. I was wondering if you would tell me a little bit about how you grew up in, in in whatever kind of musical environment you were in and how you ended up playing the guitar? Uh, well, uh, my dad was, uh, he had, there was, like if you walk through our living room, you were probably gonna trip over a number of different instruments. Uh, a lot of bluegrassy type vibe stuff. You might, you know, there's gonna be a dulcimer laying around, a banjo, a mandolin, you know, it's just all cadobro, uh, all kinds of stuff. So my dad was a big bluegrass guy and so, you know, he kind of, he just showed me like, uh, you know, G, C, and D, and I, I just took it from there, basically. That's so you I, start, did, did you start playing bluegrass? I did not. Now, I, I love bluegrass, don't get me wrong, but I, I think I was more of a, uh, actually, I started on cello. Oh, okay. Yeah, I started, yeah, I started on, on cello, cello in about, uh, I can't remember, fifth or sixth grade, maybe something like that. And then I just, the guitar... Uh, I didn't know what the, the you know the pickup chicks factor on the cello would be versus the guitar, so so I went with <laughs> I, went I went with guitar. guitar. I went with, and plus, and plus, and plus, plus you know, I, you know, I was, I was like, like uh, uh, you know, one of my best friends. When I go over to his house, he had this uh, he had this album in his record crate. It was called "Women and Children First by Van Halen. And when I saw that cover, I was like, "Wow, this looks kind of cool." And I listened to that, and it just blew my mind. You know, it's like the heaviest thing I'd ever heard, and uh, so. Instead of bluegrass, I, I got kind of into the rock thing. You, so, so before you started cello, though, you probably had in your head an entire repertoire of fiddle tunes and that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> From your well, I, yeah, I mean, there's always bluegrass at the house. Uh, uh, you know, my dad, a lot of, you'd hear, if you walked in our house, you'd hear a lot of Bill Monroe and Tony Rice and, uh, you know, stuff like that. Seldom seen, you know, all those great, just authentic original uh, bluegrass guys is awesome so you so you started playing after you heard van halen <laughs> yeah <laughs> that kind of that look that yeah just that sound that aggression that that rock that dirtier guitar i think kind of lured me you know definitely for sure but i love bluegrass don't get me wrong you know when you started playing electric guitar did you immediately like most kids that age like start a band or join a band from high school well, uh, there was a, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, obviously, that, bedroom that, time with the guitar, you know what I mean? I just kind of, like they just got me electric guitar and just kind of got out of my way, and I would just kind of, you know, go up to my bedroom and shut the door and probably, you know, was putting on any number of Kiss records to learn some Ace Fraley stuff, and, you know, Shock Me, I remember the song Shock Me, with, you know, at some point was, that was the benchmark back then, you know? <laughs> then I had to kind of work my way into Van Halen, you know? <laughs> So th that might be seem a little bit strange for people who know you as um, a solo guitarist. <laughs> I, I agree. agree. I agree. And at what point? At what point did you? I don't know. Say enough with the band. I'm going to be playing by myself. Or when did you start making the the move over to focusing so much on solo guitar? Uh, you know, I think. Um... I got a little, uh, at some point I got a little, uh, you know, I was getting heavy into the rock thing and then on into the heavier stuff, uh, you know, the 86, that uh, fruitful year of, you know, Metallica, Master Puppets and Slayer, Megadeth, Anthrax, the big four, all that. or was that 87, it was 86 or seven. You know, I was going, getting into all that too. And, uh, you know, at some point I just got a little, um, what's the word? I, I just got a little too shredded out for a little while, you know what I mean? It's like, uh, I mean, how fast can someone play? I just, I just got totally turned off by that at some point. You know, it, it's great. Don't get me wrong. I just, 
I wanted to do something else. I want more musicality, and I want, you know, at some point, I think, you know, as a musician, you have to, uh, you got to, like, make a stand and kind of figure out what it is that you are going to hang your hat on, you know, so if you want to be the fastest gun, good luck, you know, if that's what you want to do, but, you know, it seems to me there's always someone that can just totally blaze circles around you when it comes to the speed thing, you know, that's kind of like my buddy, uh, Ben Eller says, that's like bringing sand to the beach. You know, you got to bring something else with you. You know what I'm saying? So I, to me, I wanted to hang my hat on the groove. That, that's what really got me. I started drawing more inspiration from uh, bass players and drummers and bringing that, those elements to my playing. You know what I mean? So everything, I wanted to focus on the groove because to me, that's where all the attitude and the swagger is. And I've always said this to my to my younger friends that they'll you know I get messages about advice and things and I tell them that you know groove is the it's like a a good defense on a basketball team or something and groove travels so if you if you if you really committed to the groove you know that that's where you I think that's that's a fail proof plan right there if you are committed to the groove and it will travel so if you know if I go to Jersey tomorrow I'm still gonna groove. But if I'm just shredding, maybe I don't have the maybe I don't have the my licks on my A game on a particular night. But I'm always going to have my groove. You know what I mean? That that's the way I started looking at. That's what I look the way I look at it. So a lot of well, a lot of players will say, "Okay, I'm going to work on my groove." So immediately they just start playing funk, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, right. I know that there's probably a, a hundred people now saying, oh yeah, well I play, I play jazz guitar and I groove too. Guys, relax. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, nice. I, you know, but generally speaking, when, when you talk to a guitarist about groove, um, usually you'll hear them play a funk thing or what have you, but you That's not necessarily, yeah, that's not necessarily it. Just cause you know, a, you know, a James Brown ninth, dominant ninth chord doesn't mean it's funky necessarily, but. There's just a commitment. You got to get down on one knee and ask that groove to marry you. You know what I mean? It's like you got you got to commit. You know, it's a it's a, an integrity thing and it's a commitment thing. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm trying to. Say. And that never expires. By the way, that never expires. Groove never expires. You know, lick lick licks come and go. Groove is is a constant. And also, when you're to me, when I'm gigging, you know, I've been gigging all weekend actually, but. I notice if I'm really locked into the groove, it almost doesn't even matter what I'm playing because if I if I'm playing, I look around and I see heads bobbing, or if I I even look at people's feet sometimes, like yep, yep. you know, just to see if, if those are moving, then I'm doing my job. So and it's almost like you can do no wrong. It doesn't even to me. It, I mean, I guess it matters kind of what you're playing, but not really. As long as you're grooving, you're good. That's all I'm trying to say. I agree. I agree. You're winning. That's a win right there. Unless the foot's headed towards your head, and then that's not good. That's not good. You might want to, you might want to change songs at that point. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So before we follow this groove train mm -hmm. um, and talk about when you were playing metal, you were obviously playing with a pick. And I, I just recently, I recently saw a video of you um, soloing over Spain with a pick. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Probably butchering it. I was probably butchering the song badly. You weren't butchering it, and actually, you <laughs> played with with great time. alternate picking you know where I got my alternate picking from when I was back in my more shreddy days I actually kind of when I first started I was more of a left-handed uh, I'm a right-handed player but I was a uh, you know more of a left hand on my fretboard legato hammer-ons pull-offs picking very little and my brother uh, who's about a year and a half older than me he was all he would uh, he was a great uh, you know influencer like he would uh, he had like I went in his room and I saw a cassette tape of a guy named Steve Morse you know who Steve Morse is? That's my guy. I love Steve Morse. Steve Morse is probably one of the greatest living ambassadors to guitar playing. You know, he's just something. I just love that dude. A lot of cats really love that that guy and just look up to him. But 
one thing, my brother had a cassette tape of an album called The Introduction, which is a solo record. You know, he did the drag, Dixie Drags, obviously, before all that stuff. But somewhere in the early, mid-80s, he had an album called The Introduction. And uh, I listened to that, and it just blew my mind, because I, I, I could hear him picking every single note, and that's not something I was totally doing, I was kind of doing, but he really made me look at my alternate picking and try to get really precise with the down and upstrokes alternating. No cheating, he, he's old school, he just right by the book, I mean, just totally... Just alternate pick. So I got really obsessed with flat picking and alternate picking. So He's so articulate with the pick, particularly if, if anyone's ever uh, gone back and studied some of that Dixie Dread stuff. Oh, man, it's, it's so amazing. You know what? I can honestly say I, I've learned everything by ear. That's how I learned how to play. And, uh, but the Dixie Dregs, that's the only time I bought a tablature book because I had no idea what Steve was doing. And then once I, once I looked at those tunes, I understood why. It was just like mind-blowing man he is so good it's just unreal do you read music or it, do I, you don't, read I do not i do not i do not no but when you were figuring out tunes you know or songs back then in your rock era it was all by ear yes sir that's correct yeah you just do it over and over again you just play along with the record till you you know you're satisfied that you're lining up with what you're hearing you know so there's a lot of rewinding and you know <laughs> I, I, I know a lot of people like to, me to ask this question and do you have perfect pitch i don't think i have perfect I, ha, I would say i have really good relative pitch but i don't think it's like if i just heard a note out of nowhere or a car made a certain or an airplane or some kind of made something kind of or an animal made a noise i could actually figure it out but i don't just i, I don't generally just snap to it you know, but, but I have really good, really good relative pitch, I think. Right, and it's obviously no problem for you to figure out songs that all the, I'm, I'm presuming that all the songs that we've heard you play that are up on YouTube that have really intricate parts and all that stuff, that's all yeah. figured out by ear. It, it is, is, absolutely, yes, yes. I, absolutely. Yeah, because I don't trip. Did you slow any of that stuff down? No, actually, no, I did not. I just, uh, at some point, I just got really obsessed with harmony, so if I hear you know, five notes and a chord moving around. I, I just got to the point where I could like keep my ear like a, a so a, you got a chord and then it moves to the next chord. And let's say both of them are five notes. Well, that first chord, like I could keep my ear on say the, the middle note. And then when it moves to the next chord, I could hear just what that middle note did going to the next, like how, how far did it go? Did it move a half step, a whole step? You know, I could, I'm obsessed with harmony. I love harmony. So. Okay, well, your your responses are great for my questions because I uh, I can just good. jump off right into the next thing, there which is flowing. Groove. Groove. You're grooving, man. You're grooving. I'm. You know what? I'm just gonna give you the ball and get out of your way because you're grooving. No, <laughs> you're good. You're good. Um, so, <laughs> so you're obsessed, but you're obsessed with harmony, and yes. I would know a thing or two about harmony as well. And I notice that you know quite a bit about jazz. Nah, I, I would say I'm very, I, I don't think, I mean a little bit, but I'm no. I mean, compared to some of my friends, not, absolutely not. I don't uh, commit to jazz probably like I should, but it's not something that I'm going to regular gig with, which that's kind of a lazy answer, but I, I wish I would delve more into it. You know, like I couldn't just show up to a jazz gig and just, you know, off the top of my head, if they're just calling out tunes, I, the chances of me knowing, I mean, I'll, I'll know a few of the obvious ones. I'll know the Sweet Home Alabama and the Freebird ones, but you know what I'm saying. But if they go deeper than that, I'm kind of I'm kind of screwed on that. But yeah. no, that's no, fine. I, I, that's my fine. Chops are not good. <laughs> yeah, but okay. So forget about going to a gig and and like, are you going to know all the tunes they call? That's a yeah. whole nother thing. Um, yeah. I'm talking about your your ability to use to make use of jazz harmony. Like I, yeah, I, I hear that in your. I, I, you do do that. So yeah, how, I try. how did you get there? That's a good question. You know what? I think uh, and if, if we just back up just a step, I'm talking about like the rock, okay, bluegrass in my house, then I'm going over to Kiss and then Van Halen, Metallica, whatever. And then I discovered Steve Morse. But then somewhere in there, right around in that time, probably uh, – I think what happened was I really got turned on to more sophisticated stuff you would hear on the radio, like let's say like a Chicago or a, uh, a Steely Dan I'm a big fan of. And uh, obviously, you know, when you go Steely Dan, that's a whole different thing than say like a Boston tune, which I love Boston. 
Yeah, but you know, Steely, Steely Dan, Dan, there's a lot, lot more harmony going on there. You know, I mean, it's almost like a, it's almost a, a jazzy tune wrapped up in a pop way that's kind of easily digestible. I don't know if that sounds right, but yeah, no, their songs are very sophisticated, sophisticated Steely Dan stuff. But I, I listen to like uh, keyboards, you know, a lot, and listen to the voicings, and I try to get the voicings that he's playing on the keyboards as opposed to just kind of you know, estimating what I think he might be doing. I actually try to go for the actual voicings that he's playing, which are usually nothing like what you would normally do on guitar. You know, I mean, so. But that's what, that was a big step for me when I started. Li I got really obsessed with Chicago, Steely Dan, uh, Earth, Wind & Fire. And then the one that really got me what, the most was when I, when I uh, implemented James Brown into my life. That, that's, that's when everything, like, really changed for me you know what i mean i could start to see something you know what i mean so which was what which was just well we're talking about the groove but also just the, the um the way those songs are arranged it's like everyone's doing something totally different and yet you know they're able to foster that cohesion without uh no one's stepping on anybody's part and they're all playing something different and it's just the way it works together it just blow, blows my mind so at about the time that this was happening, you were moving, you had pretty much moved away from the whole Shredsville. Kind of, yeah, I did. I got a little, yeah, a little just bored with that. You know and you mean? started, and you started saying, what, I, can I figure this out by myself and play all the parts? Well, well like I say, I, so, so we're, we're talking, uh, so, my so my new obsessions are like harmony and groove. And groove. Yeah. So that's. That's, That's where I started really heading into it, but it, it took that, that and, and Stevie Wonder, Wonder, by the way, was a big influence, influence in that time frame. So, so I just started, started basically, first thing I did was just like, like everything I listened to changed all of a sudden. But that opened up so many doors for me, you know what I mean? And also, I wanted to focus on the, I'm like, what, are, what is it about these tunes that are moving me? Well, it's the harmony and the groove, and it's like, well, I kind of, I want to sound like that when I play by myself, you know what I mean? And also, there's, uh, to be totally honest with you, I'm a guy that likes to play all the time, and so I couldn't always have a bass player ready to play or a drummer. So I just started incorporating those things into, you know, my playing. Because I wanted to sound as full as one human being can possibly sound on one instrument without the use of gadgets. You know what I mean? So, Some, you know, somebody just mentioned, I showed your, um, the, the old video of you playing Cashmere on the stage with all those other people, um, all the oh, other guitarists. Yeah. That's, a, that's a fun and, night. student says this he goes he goes wait can you stop it for a second i was in the middle of it and i was like no no you're gonna miss this part he goes he's just plugged into the amp and that's it <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious you know what uh, to be totally honest with you that's hilarious but uh, i actually take a lot of pride in that you know what i gig with when i gig i use a huh. bass amp i use a bass amp for clean sound 
and a reverb pedal. That, that's all I use, just a, a bass amp, because that, the clean sound is consistent. It, uh, you know, I love tube amps too, but those tend, to, those tend to be a little moody and they change from room to room. Yeah, they might, they might they might act up a little bit and become a little unruly, or they're doing something you don't want them to do, and that can affect the way you play. But the bass amp, I'm just getting what I get what I get every time, and I love it. But I have to obviously I have to have a little reverb, or that you know, the bass amp doesn't have reverb, so that'd be a little that'd be a little painfully dry to listen to. But you know, so re, uh, bass amp, reverb pedal, I'm good. That's all I need. I just like plugging straight into the amp. Yeah. So so do you remember the first your, your first solo? guitar thing that you did that you tried to put together damn i don't remember the first one. you know what it might have been it, might, it literally may have been zeppelin or it might have been a uh, god i'm trying to think it might have been some james james brown type stuff but the james brown thing it was it wasn't necessarily like one specific song all the way through it was more like i would do like a medley of james my favorite james brown riffs you know what i mean but back but, uh, then, in, in the first, in your first iterations of your solo pieces, um, what did that sound like compared to to right now? What it like? Well, how basic? Right? Yeah, how basic oh. were they? Yeah, I would say they were horribly generic and basic <laughs> back then. But now it's it's a lot fuller. It's a lot more musical. But you know what? It might even have been. A, I'm trying to think of it a bit. That was your first one? It seemed like Bowie might have been in there somewhere. I haven't even played that for I don't even remember how to play that, but that, that groove is sick, though. I love that groove. That's but, just, but, and of course, but it's got Steve Gray on it. Hang on a second. You just went from, like, you're just figuring this stuff out to this massive arrangement. Like, <laughs> where, like where, what was the beginning? What was Ben Lacey at the beginning? Of, of that, that style? Of that style, yeah. God, I, you know what? It's probably just real simple. Real simple stuff. Probably like a lot of... Uh, probably like real simple, like left-hand bass lines. Like, uh, I would probably... You know, I'd, 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 I'd take myself all the way back there, but probably like left-hand, just hammering on like something really elementary, like... Something like a three. And I just kind of look at this hand. I'm like, what am I going to do with this hand? You know what I mean? Because this one... This hand's free to do whatever. So basically, I'll keep that going, keep it in time. Two, three, four. I think what I would do is probably just uh, take my index finger and pluck the D string, uh, just a percussive note, like a snare drum on two and four. So, two, three, four. Stuff like this. Real simple.
Just real simple, very elementary. Ben, I don't even think you realize that that stuff you just played was super complex. <laughs> Nah, I don't think you think so. I don't think it's that. So, can you would you say that you um that you have codified this style of playing? Codified. Yeah. As in as other as words, as in as other as words, as let's say I I bring little Johnny to you. He's an um, <laughs> let's say he's not so little. Let's say he's an eighteen year old who plays guitar. He's not bad. He has he has aptitude. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know how to do this. He wants to do it. Is there um, a progression of steps that I probably would have showed him? I probably would have showed him something along that line because it's very simple and there's space in it. So if you're going one, two, three, four, five, you know, something real simple like that, and there's some space in it, and it's not too cluttery, not too cluttery. So I'd probably start him off on something like that, unless uh, we can think of a mutual tune that we both dig that's kind of not crazy difficult, but something that's recognizable. We could always start there as well, but depends on what they want to learn. Everyone's different, yeah, whatever. Or they might come in with, they want to learn an Yngwie lick. I don't know, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're back to shred. Do. Back to shred. <laughs> so would you say that generally, if you were to, um, how, how would I say this? Like you're, you're gonna- Which you know what, you know what I would say? You know what I would say to that is a lot of them, you know, it's funny, I play that style, but a lot of them don't inquire about that particular style, which I think is funny because I tell them, I said, man, if you, you know, if you can groove, you, I think you'll always have some sort of gig. You won't have, you, I don't think you'll experience too much lull in, uh, say, being able to perhaps generate income, you know, with your instrument, if you can groove, because like I said earlier, that never expires. So I've always thought it was interesting that, you know, they might want me to show them a bush riff or, or something, you know. I haven't talked in a while, to be honest with you, but uh, I tell <laughs> no, myself I was that, that, tells how long, <laughs> that tells me how long it's been since I've taught, because that was the that was a thing. That was a thing back then. You know, it was like Bush, Creed, uh, you know, Smash Mouth. What? This must be like what mid late nineties. Yeah, guess? I was gonna I say, know. Ben, you have no worries. Nobody's ever gonna ask you to learn that Bush song <laughs> <laughs> again. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. But no one asked me really. They didn't want to. In other words, no one really wanted to focus on that. I, and I was like, ah, I think you should uh, add a little bit of just the groove. You know, I know it's it's hard to uh, you know quantify exactly what that groove thing is, but I like it. I, I'm glad. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say solo guitar is a hard thing to sell. It's a little tricky, but it it is. It is. Would you say that generally speaking? If you were gonna, if you were gonna describe what you're doing in very simplistic terms to somebody sure. who's interested, would you say, okay, what what you're you're seeing my hands do a lot of stuff, but my left hand is doing a lot of hammer-ons, right. and right. my right hand is taking care of a lot of the percussive elements. Yeah, you have to play this, the the chord stabs and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but would you say it's broken up in that fashion? Yes, I would. And I just thought of something to really just to elaborate on what we're talking about. I think a lot of them, when they come in for lessons, they automatically they want to be the fastest guitar player in the world because that's like the cool thing to them. It's a it's a athletic thing. It's a you know, you want, they want to be a Pantheon athlete on the guitar and see how fast they can play. What, what is the what is the um, that version of solo guitar? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. That's a good question. You got me on that one. That's excellent. I have no idea. <laughs> well, maybe somebody would like to um, immediately start with the David Bowie song, which is or or um, everybody everyone wants everybody wants to rule the world. Oh, yeah. Which is a which is a pretty pretty complex arrangement. Yeah, it's like complex and simple at the same time. You know? <laughs> Of the feeling. 
thinking like the I could see the manager like at the restaurant that you're playing. He's like, I don't know about this guitarist. Let's see when he plays. And then you start open. You open with that. He's like, let's keep him. <laughs> <laughs> that song is it is a nice it is a nice opener. I, I, that's a song where I, I think of it like a, I like to see where I'm at. That's a, that song lets me know where I'm at. You know. So uh, so working up these arrangements. Um, there's a few. There's a a few questions that I have for you. And number one is, okay. do you do you like to stay true to the key of the, the actual tune? The actual key? Yeah. Uh, I would say in most cases, yes. This song, as I recall, I have to revisit it. I felt like if if I remember right, it's like it's it's kind of like the in between pitches. I think it's like. In between, it's in between standard and E flat. It's not quite either one of them. It's like right in the middle, almost. That's kind of weird. So I, to, I just went with D, uh, D on that particular tune because I can have that low D string for that bass, you know, which works out really well and it frees up my right hand to, to do other things too. So, it's not, so do you yeah, find that, that you're taking a lot of the tunes um, or a lot of the songs and you're trying to steer it to the open string thing? <laughs> Sometimes it just depends on the song. It totally depends on the song. And some songs I, I, I do purposely because they're in weird keys and I honor those and they're, you know, like a, something that's in like A flat or something that's in D flat, you know, I have to think about what those tunes are, but, you know, I... I, I the Beatles wait, tune that you did, um, um... Oh, God, if it's Beatles, I probably don't remember it. Dun, 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 dun. Da, 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 da. Oh wow, jeez. Oh, that's a beautiful song. Wow, I'm not gonna remember this. Oh, that's nice. So did that take a long time to to work out all of those parts? Something I haven't played in a minute. That's just a couple of repetitions on that, and I'm good. You know, I just got. That is, there's some weird counter things going on there. Some bass lines descending while melodies are ascending, and it's really bizarre, but it's very cool. That's a great uh, <clears throat> excerpt to learn. I, I highly recommend trying to put that together because it's just very interesting. That that was a George Martin arrangement, now wasn't it? It was. I'm not surprised. It's brilliant. That song is just hauntingly gorgeous. Anyway, so you know, so. So, um, your repertoire, when you go to a gig, mm -hmm. how many tunes would you say that you play? God, I've, I've got a gazillion of them. Um, you know, a lot of times when I walk into a room, I just, I kind of look out there first and I, I uh, you know, it's funny, we're talking about all this stuff, but I like, I can actually, I've done enough gigs now where I can set up, I mean, right now I'm playing about maybe four nights out of seven, I would say, and like, Pre-pandemic, I was playing probably six or seven times a week, you know. And then when that, and then when that first hit, obviously I was, I didn't play at all for a couple of months. The gigs, well, I mean, I was practicing like crazy. I actually kind of enjoyed it first couple of months because it was like I was a kid again. I was playing probably twelve hours a day, you know. When the pandemic, but then I went up to about two gigs per week. I'm like, all right, this is cool. And then I went up to about three or four. But now I'm hoping to get back to, you know, playing as much as we want because I think now more than ever people need music in their lives. But when I walk into a, a gig, you know, I look out in the room. And uh, I can sense right away, is it a groove room? Uh, that's the first thing. I, if it's a groove room, 
it's going to be a cakewalk for me because it's just right up my alley. It's going to be so much fun and it's going to be easy. It's going to be easy. But if, but if I get a sense that it's not a groove room, then I feel like I have to, uh, and this is funny. You, this should be posted in every freaking magazine and everywhere in the world. If, it, if it's not a groove room, I feel like I have to move my fingers fast on the fretboard. How's that? How's that, How's that for an answer? Isn't that good? There's, I thought, there's the dichotomy right there. There it is. Well, I thought that you were going to say if it's not a groove room, it's probably <laughs> one of like it's probably one of those um, like dinner music rooms where you have to. Like... <laughs> well, that could be too. Yeah, sometimes you just got to be quiet. You know, it's not always like that, but you know. Sometimes when it's a it when like it's a dinner mu- when it's a dinner music room, what is your? I don't like that. I hate that. I hate that because I can't uh, play with the same aggression. So it's almost like my playing becomes apologetic at that point because I can't. I can't. I can't spank and smack like I want to smack because someone's going to get irritated hearing my you know snare drum on two and four, which they can't feel on two and four. By the way, they're, they're going to feel stuff on one. if they're if they're on one and if they're on one and three, it's going to be a long night. You know, if they're on two and four, it's cakewalk. But if they're on one and three, they're really making me earn my money. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's for da- that's for damn sure. But yeah, a lot of, you know, if it's if I know it's going to be kind of a quiet vibe that that's a little harder for me but i do have the repertoire to facilitate that but i can't groove with the same vigor i normally would do you have your repertoire like your your tunes written down on a sheet or do you just no i totally go by just what what's going on in the in the room at that particular time i don't have any i don't have it written down but uh I just automatically go to a certain phase if i know that i can't hit the guitar as loudly as i'd like to and, and, and you know you know, I could play a tune like that Beatles tune we just did, and that's all great, and that's all good stuff. But at some point, after a couple of hours of that, I, I, I really want to groove and just hit a little more aggressively, but it, it can be tricky sometimes. Because a, a lot of people who play solo guitar, um, let's say they get 10, 10 tunes together. Okay. And, and now they're like, okay, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to having the repertoire where I could do a gig. I can yeah. almost stretch 10 tunes out if I do them <laughs> That'd twice. Be you know, if I do them twice, I can get about an hour, you know, <laughs> and then I can just do th- I can just repeat that. What, um, for people who are just starting on this yeah. journey yeah. of solo guitar, um, yeah. how, how should they get that together? The like, tunes? What, yeah, like how would, you, how would you recommend getting a repertoire together? Wow. Well, I mean... Jeez, I don't even know where to start. I mean, it's just like, for me, it's usually I'm, I'm just driving down the road and maybe I have the radio on and all of a sudden I hear a tune like Tears for Fears or maybe it's something I haven't heard in a while and it, it starts to move me and I automatically, while I'm driving, I begin to visualize, you know, if, if I'm really digging it and it's moving me hard, you know, I, I begin to visualize how I would approach it. And then so each part that changes, like the pre-chorus or the bridge you know I start in my mind I'm like oh I know what I would do there and I don't even have a guitar I'm just driving but I'm visualizing you know and that's where the inspiration starts and then I'll and then when I go home I'll start tinkering with it right away you know especially if it's just a a certain song that takes me to a place and also the song is uh you know has some depth to it harmonically and groove wise assuming it has that and then so that's that's how it happens for me a lot of times I'll just hear a song out of nowhere I'll be in a grocery store and hear some tune and it's like oh man i haven't heard that tune in forever and it, and it brings brings me back to my childhood or that's how i get the inspiration then i go home and work on them i've i've done so many tunes now it's hard for me to i mean literally stay on top of all of them so i mean you go on phases where you tend to, to play a certain batch of them a lot and then others you haven't played in forever so you got to kind of you know uh get them back under your fingers again because you kind of forget if you don't play them in a while, they're easy to forget. You know what I mean? Like, I know this arrangement of all the things you are. I've been playing the same bloody arrangement. For, <laughs> I mean, like, decades. No, I get it. The I second get it. one, it was the first one I learned. So if I learned a solo arrangement of a band, you know, a band, a solo arrangement in the, in the style of Ben Lazy. Okay, okay. I, I, I think that I would probably be stuck playing that. I mean, I would be trying to play it. Then I would get to the point where I was comfortable. Right. And then I probably, unless I did what you did and like took that journey, it would be yeah. hard for me to improvise or change. It. That's an excellent, excellent point. That is an excellent point right there. 
So uh, uh, do you find that now you have just like, it's just total freedom or do you find, oh my God, I'm playing the same arrangement all over the Well, I, I wouldn't say total freedom, but I've definitely acquired more freedom, you know? In other words, there's so many, so much, um, you know, I don't know if it's like premium, but there's so, so much um, arranged guitar going around, you know, which is great. But at some point you, you kind of hit this little, you get in this rut where it's like, well, there's got to be some way that I can do this, sound as full as possible, but but I can also express to you how I'm feeling that particular day, right? So that's that's what I think people who play arrangements all the time are going to run into is that at some point you want to be able to, you know, throw in something completely on the fly, but without, you know, it's like building a house of cards, you know, if you when you start to make up something and one of those cards comes out, maybe the whole thing just crashes. If you just try to add something into it, you know, but that's something you're really going to want to work on because you want to be able to express how you feel on that particular day too, and still keep most of your arrangement. But the, I hear a lot of arrangements where it sounds like to me, if, if they just threw in one thing out of the blue, that whole thing is going to die. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? So that's a tricky thing, but I think you should aspire to do that, right? Right. In other words, that's the next step. That's the next level you go to. Once you've been doing arrangements, well, can I keep the arrangement and add something on the fly without ruining it? You know what I mean? That, that's like the next hurdle you, that one must look at. But do you hear, like, I, I mean, I hear people playing this backbeat on everything. I don't know that it's always necessary. It's, it almost becomes habitual. I think it becomes ingrained, so you kind of do it regardless it seems i mean you it's nice to have it sometimes but it doesn't have to be everywhere you know and it can be just a i don't know if you can hear that i'm just playing a bass line just a little box simple bass line you know and if you're swinging you definitely want to i gotta have a little backbeat right you gotta have a backbeat spot while I'm keeping the bass going. So that takes a little bit. If you're playing all arrangements all the time, that's the next step you want to get to is just play. Uh, I want to make up lines while I'm playing, you know, a bass line that's kind of repetitive and a backbeat. But, I, you know, you have to have that expression in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it seems like um, it seems like every arrangement that, that I hear and I, especially on uh, like a, guys who are playing solo acoustic stuff that are tapping on the body and stuff, it's inevitable that you're going to hear the backbeat and then you're going to hear the backbeat on days of rhine and roses wine and roses right. <laughs> days of right. rhines and roses <laughs> right <laughs> um so it. yeah i wanted to i just wanted to see what your thoughts were on the ubiquitous well and we're playing by our we're playing by ourselves so you want you know you're technically a, a one man band i guess so i mean you do want to suggest a backbeat at least, you know, for the listener, I think. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's like, a, it's like, a, you know, having a, your meal and all of a sudden, you know, you, you get a couple of slices of bacon on a plate. Uh, I'm never going to turn that down. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so I mean, the backbeat, it's just nice. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that I think people really sense about your music is that uh -huh. um, you have a lot of joy in your, in your song. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. I do. I try. I, I always try to keep everything to, you know what, as you get older, the fight seems to be keeping that sort of young boyish uh, passion for it, you know, and then you get older and all of a sudden, you know, your landlord or your bill collectors are all over you, you know, <laughs> you can lose a little bit of that youthful passion, but I always try to keep that, you know what I mean? I, I really try to, as I get older, I try to keep that with me at all times. So, I'm, you know, I'm generally having fun. Unless it's not a groove room, then I'm not having fun. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it just seems that 
when you're playing, you're enjoying yourself. You don't have a scowl on your do. face and. Um, nah, I don't want to. I don't want to do it if it's not fun. I mean, guitar is supposed to be fun. You know what I mean? But if you let the elements get on top of you, it can become work. You know, we really it should be. It should just be fun. You know, that's all guitar. It's, it's fun and learning. I mean, that, that's a beautiful, that's a great combination. If you can learn and have fun, that, that you can't beat that. That's the ultimate. You know now, I mean? you said you were playing 12 hours a day in the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. What mm-hmm. about now? Because I didn't have to be anywhere. It was beautiful. Uh, is, it was your practice, is your practice schedule like um, is eight, six, eight hours a day? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, if I'm not gigging, yeah, I'm going to have it in my hands. Uh, Generally, what I mean, my day goes like this. Usually, uh, I go to bed, you know, somewhere around when the sun is coming up. But uh, you know, I, I, uh, right out of bed, I play two hours before I even consider speaking to a human being. I, <laughs> except my wife. I, I mean, you know, of course I'll say hi, but she's usually uh, we're on some different schedules. So she's at work. She's a nurse. You know, she goes in around the time I'm going to bed. She's going to work basically. But when I wake up, as soon as I get up after six, seven hours of sleep, hopefully. I play guitar for two hours straight before I do anything. I play guitar, and then and then it's usually by that time I'm off to a gig. I got to clean up, rush, go to a gig, and then uh, do that for two or three hours. And then when I come back, I'll get some food. I'll play another couple hours, and then I'll go for a long walk. You know, get some exercise, and then I'll play for another couple hours before I go to bed. That that's my standard day right there. So about eight ish. I would say eight hours. Yes. Can you give an approximate amount for somebody who, there, I'm telling you, Ben, there, there are at least 20 guitarists that are going to be watching this that are like, I, I want to do what he's doing. And this idea of actually gigging without having to deal with, you know, a bunch of other, you know, lamos um, <laughs> sounds like a good deal. So I'm willing to put in the work. I, I want to know, like, generally in a ballpark figure for a three hour ah. gig. Well, I mean, if, I, if I'm putting in that much time and I want to sound like a whole band, then I almost feel like I should be paid as if I'm a full band, almost, you know. I don't have to lug in as much gear as they do, but I mean, I, I didn't know we were going for exact amounts, but I mean, if it was literally just, if it was just down the street from my house. Yeah, like a ballpark. You know, which, I, I, might, I, I might charge like maybe, I don't know, maybe, it just depends, kind of like maybe 300 bucks for a couple hours or something, which is great. I mean, that's, like, you know. I did one of those on Friday night, but also got about 300 in tips. So, you know, 600 bucks to drive down the street and play a little gig and come right back home to my wife. I'm happy with that. You know what I mean? But some of them are, some of them are, some of them are way more than that, you know, and some of them might be a, a smidge under that. But that's kind of, that's for a local gig. That's just for a down the street gig. You know? I'd imagine that um, like a, a corporate gig would be, could be, you know, two grand for four hours. Yeah. Yes. You yes. know, and, which I think yes. is totally fair. And I think anybody mm-hmm. who's watching this would say that if they had the cash to pay for Ben Lacey to come play at their party, um, two grand would be. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I like two grand, but the, the problem with the two grand thing is those don't come around as much as, say, like the offers that are just down the street. So if I can. But if, but but if I can but here's the thing you know if I, okay so I, let's say I made six hundred a couple nights ago let's just say um, in the ballpark but but think about if you do about four of those a week you know just on, just down from your house I mean that's I'm not rich by any stretch but I mean you can probably tell by looking at me I don't miss a lot of meals so I mean that's I mean that's if you do that about four times a week you're in pretty you know you're in pretty good shape you know what I mean <laughs> the reason why I wanted to um, ask that is because I think that there are people who really would like to pursue the solo guitar thing. And it's something that I have never done myself. It's right. constantly been about improvising and learning how to improvise and single note sure, stuff sure. and economy picking and swiper sure, sure. picking and all this other kind of carry yeah. on. And um, I think it's neglecting a huge aspect that the guitar can cover. I agree. I agree. And it's one of the things that you prove, you know, on, on like literally every one of those lazy boy recordings. <laughs> That's usually, you know what, those, those, are, those, those are usually just, just me, like, right, like out right out of bed. bed. Like I told you, when I get out of bed, I play a couple of hours immediately before I do anything. I just commit to those two hours right there. And then, but yeah, I'm usually in my just recliner, not even awake. You know, I, mean, I don't even show my face. I'm just kind of, you know. Just, I'm not even awake, you know, my hair is going about 20 different directions, which it probably is now too, but, but yeah, I just, that's what I do right out of bed. But here's the thing about solo guitar, 
is that it's a little more elastic in, a, in the way that it, it, uh, it tends to fit in a lot of different settings. You know what I mean? It can fit right in because it's not too overpowering. You know, a lot of times with the band thing, you know, you get people wanting to be tight on paying you. And that's great. And bands are awesome. Don't get me wrong. But like guitar thing from a volume standpoint, it just, it fits into, you know, if you're in a band, you obviously have to play somewhere where you can enjoy some volume without people getting on your case about it. You know what I mean? So, but there's a lot of gig opportunities where volume, you, you have to, it has to be a lot less volume. So get, uh, guitar in that way is a beautiful thing because I can fit into a lot of different settings, more settings. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> where did your okay. where did your confidence come from in your playing? Like when you the Cashmere recording was obviously done a while ago, um, yeah. on that on that stage, and you seem to be very very comfortable up there. While all those people were looking at you, I don't know if you've seen. Did you see the looks on their face? I the look on their face was like one guy was like. <laughs> Man, that was a that was just a beautiful night. That's at the that's at the Ryman Auditorium for All Star Guitar Night, which is a you know a, a little offshoot thing from the Nam Show they do. Uh, you know, so Muriel Anderson hosts it, and there's so many great there's so many great players. I mean, one of my heroes, Phil Keggy, is on stage. You know, ah, just unreal. So it, it was just uh, some nights the stars just align, and it's just a beautiful night. I didn't even know what I was going to play that night. I had no idea what to play even. So I was just kind of like getting close to time, getting a little panicky. And I said, you know what? I'm going to play Led Zeppelin. I said, I was thinking to myself, they'll either love it or they'll hate it. But if they love it, I think they'll really love it. And it just kind of, it just ended up being a good choice that particular night because it was kind of far and away from uh, what everyone else was doing too. So that made it stand out, you know, in a way too. Because everyone, you know, everyone, such great players, but that, a lot of them were just real mellow, acoustic finger style and it was all beautiful. And I said, well, let me just see if I can take it up a notch and let's see if we can inject some groove into this room. And that's such a beautiful venue too, the Ryman, you know, which is an old church. And boy, you talk about the spirits, the musical spirits in that place. It's a thing of beauty. It's very profound. So for some reason, I thought I would channel that Zeppelin tune and it just worked out really well. I got lucky. It worked out really well that night. You can see, yeah, I, I am having a lot of fun, but you know what? A lot of that is too. It's it's so funny. I'm having a great time, but you know, you, you know, you're being recorded, and you got all your you got some heroes on stage, some of your favorite players, and the, you're at the rhyme, and so really, I'm smiling, but inside, I'm going, God, please don't mess up. Too bad. <laughs> so I'm smiling, but there's a little bit of fear in there, but the smile kind of uh, you know balances it out a little bit. But yeah, it, it relaxes me to smile sometimes. You know what I mean? So. Well, it can it really does come out in your playing uh, on every thank you scene, whether thank it be you. Nam that play that um, I suppose there there are a bunch of other videos where it just seems like you have a lot of, you're projecting a lot of joy, and I think that that is a really if if if, if somebody missed everything from this interview, right, <laughs> right, <laughs> like they couldn't understand anything. Well, that, but isn't that what it's about? Isn't that what a performance is? You. I'm supposed to be projecting some sort of passion or joy, and then, and then it should be hopefully reciprocated from reciprocated from whoever's there. And it, so I'm giving energy; they're giving it back to me, and then that elevates me. You know what I mean? So that that's that's the whole deal. Yeah. If people want to reach you for lessons, or mm -hmm. do you have any like do you have any of this stuff? I, you know, the classic thing is like, do you have tabs? You know, do you have? <laughs> I, get, I get that a lot. I get that a lot. You know what? If I had to write down one of my arrangements on tab, that would probably take me a year because it would look so bizarre with it's just uh, depending on what song it was. But you know, some of those arrangements can get pretty crazy. You know, a lot maybe of they should do going. what you did. Mm -hmm. Use their ear and figure it out. Well, that's the thing. I don't. Yeah, because I don't always trust. 
tablature. You know, I, I in the one case where I was learning Dixie Dreg stuff, Steve Morris, I did because I learned it and it lined up when I played along with it. It was perfect, but I don't always trust tab. I would much rather go by my what my ears tell me. You know what I mean? So that's how you develop your ears. It's just trial and error, doing it over and over again and listening to something until you, you know, you're fairly certain you have it, but your ears get so good doing it that way, I think. You know what I mean? So do you, do you have a way for, for potential students to reach out to you? Well, you know, well, you know what? I'd be, if I'm going to be totally honest with you, uh, I'm gigging a pretty good amount right now. So I'm not re- honestly even really teaching at the moment. But once this thing, once this thing hopefully goes away, this pandemic thing, I, I've already had my first vaccine. I'm going for my second soon. Uh, once we get where we feel like we can really be around each other and it's kind of a thing of the past, hopefully that's sometime soon, I hope. But I, it could be a while. But then I would like to do them in person. I would like to do lessons in person a little bit. But I'm mostly, you know, between practicing and gigging a lot, I don't have a ton of time for that at the moment, to be honest with you. I used to teach all the time, but like, say, back in the, in the Bush days when we were talking about Bush. And, <laughs> <laughs> that's all anybody wanted to learn. But I, I did it a lot then. And at some point, yeah, at some point I was just like, eh, it, I, I mean, teaching is awesome. Don't get me wrong. I love it. I, it's been so long I kind of forgot – you know how fulfilling that can be too to be totally honest with you but i started gigging so much that i, I just didn't really and you know uh, to be totally honest with you it, it began at some point when i was really teaching a lot uh this is probably 20 years ago you know it felt like a lot of the parents were just dropping off their young children for me to babysit them for a little while and i was just like ah man this is cutting into my practice it wasn't even worth the dough it wasn't even worth the money to me i'd, I'd much rather be practicing but that was that's when i started focusing on gigging more I, you know so but I, I would love to return to doing a little bit of teaching here and there. But I'd like to do them in person. I would really love to do them in person. You know, so. Well, that's, gr- that's great. And um, yeah. we just keep an eye out for more of your videos. I really appreciate sure. the time that you took to do this, Ben. You know what? During the, during the, when the pandemic hit, I did two things right away, right when the pandemic hit. One, as I said, I'm horribly out of shape, so I'm not going to let this thing get me while I'm down. So I, I took up walking. So I've been walking like I've lost some weight, which is great. But I also, I put myself on a little bit of a no cover tune diet, a strict no cover tune. So I've been working on my own stuff. So the next videos you might, you might see will be my stuff, you know, cause I, I really focused on that during the pandemic. You know, I put the, put away the covers for a while. And I said, this is the perfect time to really focus on me. You know what I mean? So. Fantastic. Well, if you have, if, whenever those videos come out, I will tag you. I will thank, put thank them up buddy. on my, um, on my IG, my Instagram. They will, they will be grooving. I don't know if they'll be good, but they will be. Gro- they will definitely be grooving. I assure you of that. That's that's awesome, Ben. Well, I wish you all the best. All right. Hey, it's been a joy to talk to you, and I appreciate you having me. <laughs>